There have been a number of, of individuals that I met or things that they told me or, or people told me or taught me that were really impactful in my life. And, and I hadn't considered it until I received this invitation, but probably my course for being a wildlife biologist started almost 30 years ago in a hunter education course where I learned about not only hunter safety, which is extremely important, but the relationships of habitat and wildlife, where to find wildlife. It's one of my, it's, when I know I'm speaking to a room of hunters, it makes my job extremely easy because my message about habitat is already well understood to most hunters, I'll say most uh, hunters in the room. Whether it's grouse habitat, turkey habitat, woodcock habitat, whatever it might be, hunters have a good idea of what they're looking for. Um, and, and that also means they have a good idea of some of the issues that we face in managing these species. So thank you all for what you do and, and for your, your role in educating Ohio's hunters about the, those relationships. So enough of that, let's, let's jump right into wild turkey. And uh, I always, recently I've always started presentations with the OGNR mission of the Division of Wildlife Mission specifically to emphasize the balance of wise use and the protection of these species. And, then, and everything we talk about will be that balance uh, for wild turkey. But I know this is part of higher education courses now. At least I saw it in my quick review earlier this week. Uh, so I won't, I won't dwell on that. Another thing I noticed in, in my quick review of current uh, higher education, well, advanced to uh, current hunter education study guide. Uh, which I realize there are a lot of things in there that probably I should review myself after 30 years. Uh, but I have, since I've been with the division, I've covered normal bobwhite, ringneck pheasant, other grassland species. Uh, I've since moved into the forest game bird world. And I have, for all of those species, used this bucket analogy. And for whatever reason, I thought I had come up with it. I thought I was really clever. Oh, leaky bucket, all these things, all this. It's a great analogy. I, I'm really glad I thought of that. I realized I probably picked that up at Hunter Ed or from some other more clever biologist, and I just completely forgot. Uh, so I'm glad, glad to see that. It's a great analogy. I might use it uh, later today. But yeah, we should all probably we being me. I know you all are well aware of the content of other education courses, but uh, I had to go in there and review quite a bit. So wild turkey in Ohio. So wild turkey are, are one of the, probably the uh, best examples of wildlife restoration success in North America. Um, and we'll talk about the history of that. But they're our largest game bird. They're Ohio's most popular game bird, with probably in excess of 70,000 birds pursuing the species each year in the spring and or the fall. Uh, lifespan, we'll say roughly two to four years. We're learning more about that now. Pennsylvania uh, has a telemetry study ongoing where they captured an animal that had been banned in 11 years prior. Uh, that's highly, that's unusual. Probably one of the oldest birds on record, at least with bands. And you're very right. Uh, yes. Um, but typical lifespan, we'll say two to four, which is actually quite a, a little long for a, a ground nesting game bird, say, comparing to quail or, or pheasants as an example. They have some uni unique behavioral traits. They have some social structure in their flocks. Uh, there's seasonality in, in their behavior, and we'll talk about some of that when we get into the habitat issue, uh, uh, topic. Um, they have a polygamous mating strategy, which is beneficial for spring hunters and for the regional wildlife and management of, of spring hunters. Essentially, the biology allows us to harvest some surplus number of, of gobblers. Uh, we can talk more about that when we get into spring regulations. They are ground nesters. It is a very, very vulnerable time for adult wild turkeys being on a nest on the ground. We'll definitely talk about that when we get into the research project. They have precocial young, meaning they hatch and they're out of the nest in a very short period of time. Uh, the hen does lead them around, of course, in a brood, uh, but there is no real parental care in terms of feeding and that sort of thing. So I, I talked about the restoration of success. Uh, this is a map of a wild turkey range as we understood it in 1959. So this actually would have been a few years after the restoration efforts began in a lot of states, including Ohio. 
the last recorded wild turkey uh, after 1900 was, I think, 1907. I might be off by a couple of years there, because uh, I've got a few species bouncing around in my mind. But it was the early 1900s. Uh, the very last wild turkey found in southwest Ohio was captured and killed. Uh, it's the last record we have for about 50 years after that time. Uh, so after extirpation of the wild turkey in Ohio for a variety of reasons, largely we cleared all of our forests, nearly all of our forests across the state. Uh, so habitat was a major factor in the decline of wild turkey uh, during the late 1800s, early 1900s. But then unregulated hunting was also an issue. I emphasize unregulated. Hunting is not a problem, but when there are no restrictions on, on tape, that can certainly be problematic. Um, so there were a few efforts during the 30s and 40s to restore wild turkey to Ohio using captive birds. Uh, they were, we'll say they looked like wild birds, they might have even been of wild origin, but they were raised in captivity, many of them on game farms in Pennsylvania. And some of the eastern states were using similar strategies to try to restore wild turkey. Uh, those of you that are familiar with game birds releases or game birds, captive game birds in general, these were not very uh, successful. Uh, the wild turkeys, some of the reports from, from, from uh, that time, talk about the birds walking up to humans, which is a terrible survival strategy. <laughs> they, were, they were not wearing at all, and they also roosted on the ground. They did not tree roost. So tree root, for those of you unfamiliar with wild turkey at night, they, they do get up in the trees. Uh, keeps them a little bit more safe from mammalian predators down on the ground. Uh, still susceptible to those avian predators, especially great horned owls. Uh, but tree roosting is an important survival strategy as well, and these domestic birds just did not do that. So domestic releases, even though they were they included thousands of, of domestically reared or commercially reared uh, turkeys, um, these were largely unsuccessful. Very fortunately, um, in the early 1950s, wildlife biologists across the eastern U.S., a notable biologist in West Virginia named Wayne Bailey uh, developed strategies for capturing wild turkeys uh, from the wild and transporting them to new places. Uh, I know this, at least for me, this seems like it would have been common knowledge because we've, we've known about this for so long, and largely the strategies have been changed. But prior to this, no one really had a good strategy for capturing and moving wild turkeys. It involves rocket nets, We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but by 1959, the division had received a number of birds from, from other states. Uh, I think my next, there we go. So based on the records I have, these are the states and the numbers of birds provided by those states. Missouri provided the bulk of our birds, 71. Uh, we had 11 come from Kentucky, 14 from West Virginia. Likely Wayne Bailey, uh, captured those 14 for us. Uh, we had um, birds from Arkansas, Alabama, Texas, and six came from uh, Florida, interestingly. And there, those of you familiar with wild turkeys across North America know there are, are various subspecies. And in Florida, there is the Osceola, and we did receive six Osceola from Florida, so a different subspecies. The subspecies you'll find in Ohio and across the eastern states is the eastern subspecies. Uh, those six went to Shawnee State Forest, and it's thought there was no reproduction, they did not persist. So those of you that were licking your chops thinking you can go down to Shawnee State Forest and get an Osceola, you're probably wrong. Uh, but there is, there's some interesting research going on across the state about the genetics of the various subspecies, and how we might have muddied those waters with our restoration effort. But as far as we know, the six Osceolas uh, did not survive. In total, uh, 153 birds came to Ohio in the 1950s and early 60s, and that's, that reignited Ohio's wild turkey population. 153 birds from those various states. They were tremendously successful, uh, much more successful than, than the uh, domestic birds that we were attempting. As I mentioned, uh, the methodology was rocket nets over a pile of bait, um, corn preferably, turkeys really like corn, 
Um, so you can see here, I, I, I apologize, I don't have years for these photos. They are pulled from a, a document, I believe, from the early 80s, a report from the early 80s. But you can see at the top left, um, a biologist baiting an area for wild turkey. Time of year is winter, and the best conditions are snow cover. And we're actually in the midst of a trapping effort right now. And I've been fighting 60 degree days, uh, so I'm really glad to see the snow, but I haven't looked at the forecast. My guess is it's not going to stick around very long. Uh, but snow cover and cold really makes our trapping efforts a lot easier, a lot more successful. Probably difficult to see, but uh, right here is one of the, the actual rockets. It just looks it's a really heavy metal pipe. Um, finally, uh, constructed with rocket ports uh, specific to the rocket charges that we use. Those sit either on the ground or on top of the box and when they are fired, that exhaust comes out those rocket ports in the back and the rockets carry the net up over the bird. I've actually got a video on it. Uh, later you can see a photo on the bottom left of a net being deployed uh, just over an open field with no birds, just as a demonstration. Birds that are captured, Go, get put in transport boxes. In the early 1950s, they were transported to Ohio for release, uh, largely in southeast Ohio, where we had the best forest cover. And at the time, biologists thought that's the only place turkeys will ever live in Ohio. They've got to have a lot of forest. That's the only place we have a lot of forest. Um, and so they'll only ever live there. And that's where we concentrated our restoration effort. As you all know, uh, biologists are at times wrong, myself included, and uh, wild turkeys proved us wrong, and they started to expand into other areas of the state uh, where there was less forest cover, areas that, that biologists at the time thought turkeys would never survive. So the map on the left is 1981. At this point, I think we've received all the birds uh, from other states. They've established in southeast Ohio in the dark areas you see, and then we began, the Division of Wildlife began trapping birds from those areas where they were doing very well and moving them to new areas of Ohio to sort of speed up the, the expansion uh, and, uh, and growth of that population. So by 1988, uh, we've been very active. We've moved birds to a lot of different places and birds that had been moved to those areas grew very rapidly and expanded their, their range. Um, and it was by roughly the year 2000, I think we had, we, we claimed that we had, we had birds in all 88 counties um, and restoration or translocation efforts, movement efforts continued until 2008. Some of the last counties to receive birds are some of the most highly agricultural counties in western Ohio. West Central Ohio, including my home county of Union. Uh, so I didn't see my first wild turkey in Ohio until I was maybe 19. Dad and I were bailing the day, and a turkey ran across a cut hay field. And we both looked at each other like, I think that was a wild turkey. So, yeah, very interesting for me, I guess. Uh, capture efforts this is a more modern photo of a rock, rocket uh, attempt. You see the hand. Uh, possibly some jakes on their net. Uh, the rocket was probably deployed from the, the wood edge over where those folks are standing. They've got cardboard boxes out that are transport boxes. Uh, very similar to what we still use today. So this is very likely a photo from that translocation effort where we were still moving birds within the state of Ohio. Releases were kind of uh, public events, I'm told. Uh, I wasn't with the division when any of this was going on, but uh, maybe some of the folks in the room probably were, uh, but they were areas were selected based on what seemed like suitable turkey habitat, and then we moved birds to those areas uh, and had sort of a release event uh, in each of those places. As I mentioned, uh, the restoration effort was tremendously successful, not only in Ohio, but in all the other states that lost wild turkey or had their wild turkey numbers dwindle down to almost nothing. The blue uh, here on the map is the eastern subspecies. Um, so you can see it's pretty expansive across eastern U.S. and of course Florida and everything else in the As you get west, and you come to Mexico, you've got some of the other stuff, subspecies uh, that we don't have to worry about here in Ohio. But there are some gaps in that Ohio map that 
this time. Uh, we still caught some of the agricultural areas. I think this map maybe is from the early 2000s. Uh, we thought turkeys hadn't really made their way into some of those places or hadn't established themselves. If we were asked to fill in that map for Ohio today, we would just fill it in completely, all 88 counties. Um, and part of the, the reason for that success is the, the wild turkey's uh, tremendous adapt, adaptability and also their ability to move, very much like deer in that way. They can, they can move to long distances to new locations, expand their range, but wild turkey habitat is fairly broad. So here, just have a successional diagram from all the way on the right, or, or excuse me, the left side, an area that would be intensively disturbed or repeatedly disturbed. You might think of an agricultural field on that side of the diagram, all the way to what we'll consider maybe an old growth forest, a deciduous forest that's 80 to 100 years old in Ohio. It's about the best we can do. Wild turkeys will use habitats all across that spectrum. They're very adaptable. They have a few restrictions, which we'll talk about, that, that sort of determine how many turkeys an area will hold. But another important consideration is within this diagram, there are lots of different areas that wild turkey will use for different reasons. And that can be important to the hunter. That's also very important to the wild turkey manager. And as we identify some of the factors that impact wild turkey, Again, we'll talk about that in the research project or uh, part of the presentation. There are areas within this diagram, important habitat types that we can focus on that, that can make dramatic improvements as we identify sort of the weak links in the chain of wild turkey biology. So as we look at the state today, wild turkey abundance, the number of turkeys we believe to be in a population inside a county, uh, the dark areas represent areas of high abundance, gray areas, slightly lower abundance, what we'll call medium, uh, and then all the other counties we'll call low abundance. We have no counties where turkeys are rare or absent. Arguably, there's a few, especially out by the lake, where it's pretty challenging to find a wild turkey, but they are established in those counties in a fairly low number. But I would still consider that to be low abundance. Those of you that are familiar with the Ohio landscape can surely see, uh, or surely figured out what's going on here. Uh, the map on the right is a map of Ohio forest cover, so green representing the forest across the, the, the landscape of Ohio. Generally speaking, more forest, more turkeys. Um, that is not a perfect relationship. Uh, it doesn't fully explain sort of the nuance um, what you see here is a messy graph that biologists like to put up. I don't know why we continue to do things like this that we have to explain while we're, we're in presentation. But essentially what you see at the bottom is the percent forest cover for a five square kilometer area. Let's just call it a township. So percent of forest cover in a township. And then on the, on the y-axis moving up and down on the left is uh, the, the predicted spring harvest, which we'll talk about, we, we often use as a measure of turkey abundance. So higher spring harvest, we guess that that area probably has higher turkey abundance. Zero percent forest cover over an area to about 40 percent forest cover is increasing turkey abundance. So across the landscape, as you go from 0% forest cover to 40% forest cover, you get more turkeys within that landscape. Once you get to 40% forest cover, roughly, you don't see any additional benefit with more forest. So a, a landscape with 40% forest cover has about the same number of turkeys as a landscape with 60% forest cover or 80% forest cover or 100% forest cover. You could probably even make an argument that there can be too much forest cover because turkeys definitely derive benefit from agricultural operations, open fields, mixed landscapes, and so forth. So the sweet spot more than likely is somewhere between 40% and 80% forest cover across the landscape. And when you look at the Ohio counties that have the highest turkey kill in the spring, those are the types of landscapes that you're looking at. Pretty heavily, forest, uh, heavily forested counties, 
but you've got some broken areas of agricultural fields, pastures, row crops, uh, those sorts of things. So one of the things I, I like to emphasize here is turkeys are impacted by the broad landscape, the amount of forest across a broad area. You can absolutely have impact on the use of a property by manipulating the habitat on the property, uh, improving it for wild turkey in one manner or another. But it's really challenging to decide, me in Union County, I'm going to turn Union County into a high abundance county in Ohio. That's not going to happen. We're an agricultural county. I think we've got roughly 15% forest cover, if I remember correctly. That's not something that we're going to be able to change. Uh, so more than likely, uh, wild turkeys have reached their, their peak abundance in a county like Union at a fairly low level compared to some of these more heavily forested covers, uh, or counties, excuse me. I do that just to temper everybody's sort of expectations with habitat work with wild turkey. They are impacted by the broad landscape and specifically the amount of forest cover, uh, which it is really difficult to change the percentage of a forest cover, at least positively, um, across a, a county. So let's dive into some of the data that, that I use regularly in monitoring wild turkey and, and talking about wild turkey, answering questions about wild turkey. So here we have a spring, uh, the totals for uh, across the modern spring season uh, in Ohio, gray bars being the total spring permits issued statewide, and the red bars being our total spring harvest. As I mentioned previously, spring harvest is a really good indicator of overall turkey abundance in the state. It is not a perfect indicator because the number of turkeys killed is reliant very much on the number of hunters we have. Um, but it is, it is still a good indicator, and as you can see, the number of permits has changed, and that's going to change the number of hunters that you've got out there chasing the turkeys. Mm -hmm. But what, what uh, we see with the red bars is a period of growth. That's our restoration efforts and our, our translocation efforts, moving birds across the state. They were, very, they were expanding, their population was growing, uh, as was the popularity of, of turkey hunting as you see the growth in those gray bars through the 80s, 90s, and even into the early 2000s, reaching a peak around the early 2000s, both in spring harvest and in total permits issued. We have since then declined somewhat, um, and this is a pattern that is not only seen in Ohio, but seen in other states that have a similar history to Ohio of restoration. Very rapid growth, reaching a peak at some point, and then kind of settling down you guys are probably all familiar with carrying capacity. I know it's part of the hunter education uh, uh, content. More than likely, it, the hypothesis that's been proposed, as we've seen turkey numbers somewhat lower than what you may remember 20 years ago, uh, one hypothesis is we overshot carrying capacity following the translocation and really successful restoration. And then Mother Nature knocked us down a bit brought us back to what is probably Ohio's real carrying capacity. That's a hypothesis at, that, at this point. It probably explains some of the patterns we see, not only in Ohio, but in other places. Um, but we've got a lot of, there's a lot of wild turkey research going on right now that maybe can answer questions like that. Um, we also have, of course, a, a fall turkey season. I, I put it up here just for your reference. Uh, peak. Spring turkey uh, permits issued exceeded 90,000 or almost to 100,000 in the early 2000s. We're now down around 50,000. Of course, there have been some changes recently, going from a two uh, bird mag limit to one in recent years, which is why we see the notable dip in uh, 2022 and 2023. But uh, 100,000 at its peak versus fall, less than 16,000. Fall is a much less popular season in Ohio. Um, some of the eastern states, this is more of a traditional hunt. They get a lot more fall hunters. Uh, but we have, a, we have fairly small utilization of, of fall, the fall season, and our harvest is fairly low as well. Um, we can talk more about fall season before the end. We get into regulations. Um, but in recent years, we've issued uh, a little more than 5,000 fall permits. This does exclude free permits um, for a, a couple reasons, but then our, 
our fall harvest is, is generally fairly low. It's been a range of 600 birds in recent years. So getting back to spring, where, where we feel like it's more indicative of changes in turkey abundance. Again, I'll highlight this early period, which is the restoration period. Um, at, the, at the right edge of that box, we have the peak of turkey abundance in Ohio. Across most counties, this is when you saw the highest uh, uh, spring harvest. And this is the point that people reference when they tell me, what's, when they ask me what's going on with wild turkeys. Why do I not see the turkeys I saw 20 years ago? They're typically referencing this group of years right here, where abundance was quite high. I mentioned sort of the hypothesis that we're at a new stable state or a new carrying capacity, which is why I, I kind of ask people to focus on this later period, roughly the last 20 years, where things have been fairly stable. We are not seeing a long-term trend downward or upward, it's fairly stable, but what we do see is annual fluctuation, absolutely. There is fluctuation in the wild turkey population, up and down. The number of turkeys on the landscape varies considerably, year to year, and this period in here will highlight a little bit, which, uh, which has been a specific concern and is what prompted some of the research uh, that's ongoing. <clears throat> so, uh, another manner in which we, we monitor turkeys is roadside gobbling counts. This is a paired gobbling and, and grouse drumming route where we're out in the first couple weeks of spring listening for those birds gobbling or drumming. Uh, this is not for wild turkey drumming. The, the drumming data is, is tremendously useful, uh, although the number of drummers detected, of course, is, is very small in recent years. The gobbling data is much less useful. Um, you may wonder why gobbling is, is the most important thing for the spring hunter. Absolutely, we recognize gobbling is what drives hunter satisfaction in the spring, but uh, it's less useful because it, the trend is not directly tied to all of our other indices of wild turkey abundance. In a, a year where we every other trend we have suggests turkey numbers are down, we sometimes have a spike in gobbling. And in years where we think turkey abundance is up, we sometimes have a dip in gobbling. Part of that is probably the nature of the, of the survey. We run our surveys twice in a year. We run them each route twice in a year. And as I'll show you in just a second, the day that you run the survey can matter considerably. Uh, the gobbling activity is, is impacted by a number of, of factors, including weather, and we're learning more some researchers at University of Georgia specifically, those are of you that are familiar with Dr. Chamberlain's work, uh, the turkey doc, as he's, as he's well known, uh, he's learning more about what drives gobbling activity or what impacts gobbling activity, and barometric pressure apparently has a, a major impact. We ask our officers and our field staff and our biologists not to run surveys when there's poor weather, meaning precipitation or high winds, we don't have any restriction on what the barometric pressure is. Uh, so our staff could very well be out on a day where barometric pressure is, has suppressed gobbling activity. And that's likely why we see some of the patterns that we do. So this uh, previous slide was, was a broad look at gobbling activity in the state from 1997 to 2023. This is gobbling activity within a single year, day by day. And these are using automated recorders that we put out in the field. It's, it's deployed just like a trail camera, only all it does is record sound. And then we have a biologist, not me, uh, who is clever enough to uh, essentially analyze all of the, these recordings, thousands of hours of recording. Uh, and he's got a computer program that can identify turkey calls. So we, at the moment, we've got to filter down to turkey calls, largely during this time of year would be gobbling, but there could be some other, there could be some yelps in there that get detected. <clears throat> of course, we're, this is kind of brand new to us, um, but, but shows some promising results. Uh, so essentially, as I mentioned, this is 2023, we have recorders deployed in southeast and east central Ohio. Uh, the gray bars show the, the number of detections on each day, beginning on about April 10th and carrying on through 
through May 16th. So a little bit before the season started, uh, and then into the, uh, the first few weeks of the season. What you do see is there's some variability. I mean, we see a general trend of climbing gobbling activity getting to a peak about third week of April, which is what we would expect. Um, but within that, you have some days where there is just no gobbling activity at all. Uh, some of you that go out and scout for gobblers might understand this frustration where you have birds, you know, gobbling their heads off three days ago, and then you go out there and you where did all these birds go? It's very likely they're still out there, it's just not a day they're gobbling. Uh, wish I could explain that better, but um, yeah, turkeys can be a mystery at times. I'll highlight a couple of places here. Um, the first box, the yellow box, is uh, the youth season in this year. Um, there are other states that have used this, this sort of equipment to monitor gobbling ac activity have documented a, a notable impact in hunting pressure on gobbling activity. Um, so what I highlight, highlighted in yellow the youth season, and then in red the opening days of south zone which would have impacted the areas that our recorders um, uh, were deployed. Youth season, very little impact. Uh, understandable, I mean, we have youth pressure, certainly. It's an all-day hunt for two days, but we have a few thousand youth permits issued each year. Uh, probably not nearly as intense pressure as you see in the red box, the opening day of the south zone. So you can see there, it's just one year of data. I'm really excited to continue this into 2024 and future years and see if we see the same trend. Uh, but right here is the opening of South Zone, and look at that gobbling activity. Uh, I think it's probably more than coincidence that gobbling was extremely suppressed on those days. Maybe it's possible those were just poor weather days, but I've got to think hunting activity has something to do with that. We're seeing that again in data like this from other states. Uh, similarly, we see some low, uh, low periods of gobbling activity uh, throughout the, the rest of the season. Some of those are Friday, Saturday, Sundays in the first weeks of the season. Uh, a few of those are the first few days of all day hunting. Uh, so again, with, with more years of data, it'll be really interesting to see if, if these trends continue and if you go out there and, and hear a quiet woods on Sunday or Saturday, maybe that woods will be will be lit up with gobbling Wednesday. This would be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So it looks like in that first week, Tuesday was the day to be out there. A tremendously valuable, uh, as I mentioned, gobbling has some value, but uh, is not nearly as valuable as our summer cult index. And I hope some of you are familiar with this. I hope most of you are familiar with this. Uh, so it's essentially uh, an observation survey during the months of July. <laughs> and we've done this for decades. Uh, for a time, it was just wildlife staff or forestry staff that were asked to report observations of wild turkey in the summer. And then we would ask the number of adults and the number of colts that were observed. Uh, a few decades ago, we expanded that to the public. It's essentially a citizen science survey where if you're driving down the road headed to work or wherever you're headed, and you observe wild turkeys, you can report those to us. Um, you can get to the link through our, our, our app or through our webpage. Um, make a few clicks. We've tried to streamline this process for you. Definitely heard of some complaints about how complicated it could be. But essentially, what we want to know is the county, the number of adult birds, adult hens, and if you observe males, the number of males, but then the number of colts as well. And with that, we get an index of reproduction for that year. The data I'm showing you is 1999 to 2023. Um, there are some issues with showing a data set this long because we haven't collected the data in exactly the same way over this full time period. But it's close enough that I feel confidently that I can, I can show you like this and then I'll highlight the, the red dotted line is the last 10 years where I am confident we've collected the data uh, in a consistent manner. What you see is a long term average of roughly 2.7 volts per hand. Um, once we filter all that data down, all the observations that come from 
across the state. Some, some years it was only a few hundred observations. In recent years, we've been over 2,000. Uh, so I do appreciate that from, from all the folks that are volunteering these observations. Another notable thing you may wonder about, 1999 stands out as does 2008, and then recently 2016. Do those years uh, ring any bells for anybody? Cicada. Periodic <laughs> cicada years. So 1999 and 2016 are the same brood of cicada in southeast Ohio. 17 year cicadas. They come out every 17 years. I don't think Ohio has any 13 year. There are 13 year and 17 year. I think all of our broods are 17 year. Uh, the 2008 cicada emergence is southwest Ohio. And it's due in, I think, 20, if my math's right, 2025. Uh, so uh, it, it'll be a noisy spring, summer uh, for folks in southwest Ohio next, next year. Uh, but I'm really hopeful we're going to see another big boost in turkey pulse in that year. Uh, and then not a lot of gobblers make it to three and four years old. So the two-year-old age class is extremely important in determining what uh, what the spring is going to be like. So if we shift the pulp data over two years and essentially line up the black line with the pulp data from two years prior, it starts to make a heck of a lot more sense. When we have a really good pulp year or a really bad pulp year, that's what we can expect two springs from them. So right here, 2018, is this gray bar is actually the 2016 pulp data. And that was a cicada year. And you can see in 2018, if you look at the, red, the black line, we had tremendously high uh, spring permit success. So essentially, when you hear good year, bad year coming down the pipe, this is the data I'm using. If you've got the pulp data, which is readily available on our website, you can tell what's coming. Uh, so 2024 was a good, Two years ago was a fairly good pulp year, slightly lower than, than the previous year. I expect we'll have a, a permanent success rate just about what it was in 2023. Well, I don't know if for you 2023 was a good year or a bad year. In general, our, our permanent success rate was really high. Uh, we had some changes. It's a one bird bag instead of a two bird bag. Uh, so there are some issues there in comparing the past years. But in general, I would say 2024 is going to be very much like 2023. And then I can even tell you 2020, it should be 2025. Um, sorry about that. 2025, we're going to see the success rate dip a little bit. The pulp data can also tell us regional information. Um, we don't necessarily get enough, we, we definitely do not get enough reports for me to tell you county by county uh, how, this, how things will shake out, but we can generally look in districts. Uh, so this is the poll data from 2023, yeah, 2.8. So 2023, this past summer, we were right at our long-term average. Um, things were generally better in northern Ohio. Districts 2 and 3, these are our wildlife districts. They were a little bit higher, definitely better than what we saw in District 5. So we may see some of that bear out in the harvest, but uh, I get a little bit nervous trying to break it down regionally like this. But as you can see, like District 1, we had 184 observations. Generally, the larger number of observations, the more accurate you would expect that information to be. All states, almost all states, across the eastern U.S. at least, conduct the same poll survey. It's valuable enough that all the states are doing it, we've actually standardized the way that we do it so that each state is collecting the information in the same way. So I believe this, this is information from 2022. Uh, I apologize it's not updated, but as you might imagine, it's difficult to get information from all these states in a timely manner. Uh, but Ohio's over here, um, kind of on the, the right third, and we're right there with some of our neighbors, Pennsylvania, in terms of the number of pulse per hen and pulse per brood. So pulse per hen is a measure of uh, how many pulse are on the landscape with all the hens, including hens that have no pulse. And pulse per brood is a measure of how many pulse in each observed brood. 
So how big are those breed sizes? And they tell you a little bit different things. We can, we can dive more into that if you guys have questions. But I'll just generally leave it at that. Bolts per hen is, is typically our focus. I mentioned uh, we had a concerning period recently. This is bolts per hen data, again from 1999 to 2023. Right in here, 17, 18, and 19. Uh, we had a low average pulse per hand each of those years. And we hadn't really seen, we'd seen years that low. I mean, 2014 was, was down there too. But 2014 was sandwiched between two good years, or a good year and an average year, which is more typically what we see. We have a good year of pulse, then we might have an average year of pulse, and then we might have a bad year of pulse. And it fluctuates. For whatever reason, 17, 18, and 19 were all bad. And that means your Jake class is bad, your two-year-old class is bad, your three-year-old class is bad. Uh, and that, that certainly was observed in spring by spring hunters and in our spring turkey har or spring harvest data. Um, so, so there was a lot of concern beginning right around 19 but into 20 for sure. And by 2021, absolutely. Uh, folks were claiming that the sky was falling. And to be honest with you, I was a little worried myself uh, before we got some of the, the better years uh, that followed. We didn't know if this was going to be a long-term trend, turkey poke numbers were just going to crash, or if this was a short-term thing. Very fortunately, it was a short-term thing, it appears. Because as you can see, 2021 was a very good poke year, well above average, and that impacted our 2022 season. And then 2022, uh, I think I got that wrong. 2021 impacted 2023. 2022 is going to impact 2024. So we're on an upswing, it appears, and the, and the spring harvest data reflects that. But uh, we definitely received a lot of questions from hunters, from the public, uh, from within the agency. What is going on? Um, what's the story here? Why did this happen? Is it going to happen again? Do we need to worry about long-term declines in pulse per hit? So uh, we worked with other states that have similar trends. Uh, Pennsylvania spearheaded this effort because they, they had concerns a little bit earlier than we did in Ohio. Um, essentially to assemble a collaboration of states that are going to research uh, wild turkey hens and their reproductive output. So this is a GPS telemetry study. Uh, we're going to mark hens in all of these study areas that you see in Ohio, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Maryland. Uh, they're all going to be monitored in the same way. GPS backpacks, I'll show you here in a second, uh, some of the examples. They're captured with rocket nets in the same way that we captured birds 60 years ago. Um, here's a photo of one of our rocket nets concealed uh, under a pile of straw. Essentially, we put our bait pile out there, not to give away all our secrets. We put a pile, we put a bale of straw uh, next to the bait pile. The turkeys get used to that bale of straw, and then when we are ready to trap, we swap out the bale of straw with our rocket box and cover it with straw. So you've got some gobblers coming in here. We did not fire the gobblers uh, because, again, this is a hen study interested in hen reproduction uh, and nesting effort. We did have a couple of hens come in this day. Uh, most of our shoots average about 12 hens in a block. Uh, today, we have, this day, we only had two. And this, we had a photographer out here, our, our division photographer, which is why I have such good photos of, of the net deployment. This is actually the cover on the net, a camouflage cover that can, helps conceal the net. And then we have two hens being captured there. What is amazing to me is this net deployment happens in the blink of an eye. And these hens were on a bait pile with their head down, just calm as could be, pecking at that bait pile. And they nearly escaped this net. I mean, the bird is really amazing. It makes me think about those domestic birds that we tried to release that probably would still have their heads down on the corn pile way back here. But these wild hens are so weary and so jumpy and just so tremendously, I don't want to say athletic, uh, they almost flush out from under this net, or deploys and lands in under you know, half a second. 
Um, it, it really is amazing uh, what these animals can do. Uh, so real, uh, I kind of buried the lead here. I have a few photos, but we, had, we, we deployed trail cameras on our bait files. Um, and just by chance, we happened to get net deployment. Um, it, it was just timed right. The, the cameras are out there to um, to essentially monitor the bait pile and let us know when turkeys are using it. So here we've got a flock of hens coming in. What you've got, what what you're not noticing here is there's a couple of division employees in a blind not too far away, and they are watching all this happen and trying to figure out the right time to shoot the net. And so not only do you need as many birds on the bait pile as you can get. But you've got to make sure that no birds are in a dangerous location. You've got to make sure no birds are behind the box. There's a lot going on. So if you think you get shaky in a, a blind or sitting at the base of a tree during a spring hunt, uh, this is this is uh, several times that, at least for me, some of those guys have like steel, have ice water running through their veins, I think. But if everybody get a look at that, I'll be happy to play with that. <laughs> I should have played it twice while I was talking. You guys weren't listening to a word I said. <laughs> so yeah, birds coming in. This was an early morning shoot, which I appreciate. Sometimes we sit out there all day long just waiting on birds to come in. A perfect shoot. They all come to the corn and they all put their heads down and they're in a safe spot. It's terrible when they're in little groups and they're moving on the bait, off the bait. Uh, we've got a remote detonator. Uh, we used to use, uh, we used to run a wire to a car battery. And, uh, folks would just tap the wire to the car battery. This well before my time. Uh, now we use essentially commercial grade. It's mining equipment. A remote detonator for mining uh, explosives. Uh, or sometimes we'll, we'll run a wire. <laughs> Once we've got the birds in hand, uh, essentially after that net deployment, the cavalry comes in. So we've got staff waiting a, a short distance away where they're not going to disturb the birds. You hear this cannon go off. You all jump in your trucks or your UTVs, whatever we're using that day. And we rush in. We start extracting birds from the net. Uh, they go in cardboard boxes, essentially storage boxes, the same type of boxes that you guys saw before. Uh, that just holds the bird for a short time while we can work through them. The birds get a few measurements, uh, wing length, body size, uh, weight, that sort of thing. And then they get a GPS transmitter. The hens do. J any jakes just, or gobblers just get cut loose uh, because we, at this point we're not really interested in what they're doing. We have a pretty good idea of what they're doing. But we want to know what's going on with the hens. So you can see the, uh, the folks are attaching a small plastic box. Uh, it's a GPS transmitter with a little short antenna, about three inches long. Um, internal battery, it lasts. OSU researchers program these, and they have a program to last about two nesting seasons. So a little less than two years, because these birds are about to go into their first nesting season, and then it'll last through the next year, through the next summer, fall, and into the next spring. So we'll go over the numbers in just a second. Essentially, an elastic band goes around each wing. We make sure that that is loose enough that it doesn't cause any issue. Um, this is the OSU graduate student here checking the tension of those bands. Um, we, we recently captured one of the birds from last year that had a transmitter and had a chance to really examine her and make sure that there were no ill effects. Uh, I found no abrasion, no damage, not, not really even feather wear. So we were really happy with these transmitters and these harnesses on these birds. She seemed to be doing perfectly fine. And then we release them in groups of three to four, roughly. So we've improved upon past uh, efforts, not that those folks were doing anything wrong in the, in, the, in the past necessarily, but telemetry projects on wild turkey have determined their survival after capture is actually much higher if you release them together in small groups. And it makes a lot of sense. Uh, they're a social bird at this point. They're reliant on their flock. And if you cut them loose one at a time, they're going to be out there calling and trying to find each other, and they're going to be susceptible to predation, uh, potentially. 
So we cut them loose in small groups, uh, as is recommended uh, across pretty much all all states doing telemetry efforts. I apologize; it's a little bit dark, and I definitely apologize if any of you are red green colorblind. So uh, we've got a photo of the landscape in East Central Ohio. The red line is turkey movements pre nesting. So this is a hen's movement uh, prior to any nesting attempt. Again, our focus is to learn what they're doing and how their how their survival is and what their nest success is. So we're paying really close attention to what these birds do during the nesting season. So you can see she's moving all over the places. She place she's got a few roost areas, uh, no real pattern to it. She's making broad movements um, pre nesting. And then once nesting activity begins, she's really focused in on uh, a couple areas. And this is when you know OSU really starts to focus on some other data that's collected with these transmitters. Essentially, it's her movement data, not movement from here to there, but movement up and down, side to side. When the, when they see a big change in that pattern, they know she's likely incubating, and that's that's the thing that we're really focused on. But again, uh, you, you really see a sort of centralized movements when she establishes a nest. She's probably returning to it, frequently laying, and then she's probably begun incubation um, uh, within this, this window. Interestingly, this bird is 8.8 .8 kilometers from her capture location. She's one of the longer movements, I think. We had some birds that almost didn't leave the property. We caught them all. Uh, but then we had other birds that moved long distances. I think that's 8.8 .8 kilometers. I think it's roughly five miles. Somebody help me out there. I really struggle with researchers who are in the metric system, and then I've, I've got to convey that, and I've got to, for my own brain, I've got to think about it in miles. Uh, this nest was successful, uh, and so here's a, another really interesting component of the research. What the heck do these hens do when she's got a, a brood of, 8, 10, 12 little poults in tub. Uh, so she, from down in this area where the nest was, she made some pretty substantial movements. Um, and then she ended up in that red blotch over there. That is not her nest. That is a place that she got those poults to. She did successfully rear a number of poults. I don't remember the number. Um, but she got those poults there, and whatever that, that habitat was, she liked it, and she kept them there. Generally, brooding areas where she's rearing poles, you want low-level ground cover where the poles can hide and be concealed, but they need invertebrates, insects, to eat. That, that is their food. They're growing rapidly. They need the protein, the fats that those things provide. So they're not eating seeds. They're not eating plants. They're catching bugs. Uh, so again, really important when we think about what do we want to do to boost turkey reproduction, production of poles is figure out what that habitat is and try to make more of it. And then here's a few examples of a turkey nesting site. Uh, so I work with Bob White Quail, my master's uh, work at, at Ohio State University. And you could pretty reliably find Bob White nesting cover without much trouble. It's a grass field. They went in a grass field we built a little dome nest, and that's just where they went to nest. One looked like the other for the most part. Might be cool season grass, it might be warm season grass, but it's always grass field. Turkeys are something different. I don't, I don't fully understand them at this point. I hope that I, I lost this. Um, I hope that I better understand turkey habitat uh, by the end of this, or turkey nesting habitat. And as you can see, uh, we have one turkey in an open forest, no cover around her. You could have seen her from 50 yards away if you knew where she was. Uh, she was just at the base of a tree. She made her little depression. She put 12 to 13 eggs. I think this was a pretty large clutch size. Um, and she was just there. Um, she was unsuccessful. She abandoned that nest. We don't know what, why the abandonment occurred. occurred. The eggs were not consumed, uh, which is interesting. So potentially a predator or a human uh, disturbed her from the nest. And what the OSU researcher is finding that about 20% of the time, 20 to 25% of the time, if you 
flush her off the nest, she's just not coming back. Um, so that could definitely have some implications when you think about a lot of hunters in the woods, think of how many times you've been in the woods and may have flushed a bird off a nest. Uh, there's about a 20% chance that nest just failed. It's not, I'm, I'm not saying that to make you feel bad. I've done it too. Uh, it's not like any of us are doing it intentionally, but we've got to consider that when we think about nest success and our impact on wild turkey reproduction. Middle photo is a rose picket, if I recall correctly. It's just absolutely nasty. This hen had to have crawled in there on her belly to get to the nest. Uh, so just the most dense, nasty cover you could think of. The complete opposite of the hen that nested up the base of the tree. That middle nest failed as well. I think this one might have been for David. Um, but just interesting, the dichotomy between the two nesting habitats. This one was in a hay field, um, which you may have noticed. The, the hay has been cut. Very interestingly, this nest was successful. It hatched, and the hen led them, so she made it just barely. Uh, so when, the, when the researchers got here, they thought surely the nest had been destroyed by the hay vine, uh, but they determined later that that hen had actually you can actually tell by the eggshells if any of them were intact, whether they were hatched or predated or just crushed. Um, and then they determined that that hen had holes with her a few days later. So it, it's a, I haven't gone into all the detail in the coming years. There's two graduate students at Ohio State University. I anticipate there will be a lot of presentations at various uh, outlets, or if you have events, invite these folks. Uh, they need to practice, invite these folks to come and talk about their project, um, invite me, I need to practice too, um, but I'd be happy to talk about this stuff if, if, uh, if you guys are more interested specifically in this research project. But it is an intense focus on hens and their reproductive output. And then just real quick, here's some of the preliminary data from last nesting season. Uh, so we had 49 hens tagged. Um, we censored four, meaning they had to be eliminated from the analysis because the transmitter failed or they disappeared on the landscape. Uh, it's kind of a challenge to find them after they move several miles. You don't know which direction they may have gone, so the search area can be quite large. So four of 49 were eliminated from the analysis because of, of those issues. Um, we had one hen killed before the nesting season. So we captured them in February and March. I think this hen was killed at the end of March, maybe early April, before any nesting activity occurred. Uh, she was predated, we thought it was a mammalian predation, so potentially coyote, bobcat, fox. Um, so all the rest of those hens made it, in the nesting, made it into the nesting season. Uh, we have 58 total nest attempts. So that means we had hens making multiple attempts. So some made two attempts, some made three. Uh, so uh, several more nest attempts than we had active hens. The number of hatched nests was nine. So nine of 58. It was a notably low nest success. Much lower than has been identified in some other states. Um, I shouldn't say much lower, we're actually sort of on par with some other states, much lower than what was identified in Ohio in a similar study uh, by Dave Swanson and Mike Reynolds, if you know those folks. Uh, so when they were in my position, there was a study in the early 2000s, and that's kind of been our guiding research until this point. Uh, but they had a roughly 49% nest success rate at that time, about half. Uh, so much lower nest success, uh, and then it, add to that, uh, we do a two-week check. We, we go and find the hen two weeks after hatch and four weeks after hatch and determine if she has any poults left. And uh, most, many of those hens lost their poults between that two-week or four-week period. So a number of broods that got to two weeks from those hens is five. So five hens still had poults. Uh, at two weeks after hatch, and only three had holds four weeks after hatch. 
So notably low nest success, notably low poult survival. Um, interestingly, our hen survival is extremely high, very high. I was just at NWTF National Convention and several states gave presentations like this one, um, you know, talking about their hen survival, their nest success, and, and brood and poult survival. I think Ohio's hen survival was the highest. We still have 36 of those 49 hens alive today, active GPS transmitters. Uh, so of the four that we emitted, a few of those could be alive as well. So 36 of the 49 are still alive. We will follow those hens into the nesting season. Another interesting thing is all the mortalities except for two occurred while the hen was nesting. So Hens started nesting, they started incubating, and then they started dying. Outside of the nesting season, we lost two birds. One to the male, mammalian predation that I mentioned, that was before the nesting season, and then one got hit by a car in October. Since then, we've not had one of these hens die, not only um, since the end of the nesting season. But again, uh, we've got to figure out why nest success is so low, why brood poult survival is so low. Um, this research is important not only to answer questions about wild turkey reproduction and why we, why we see low pole production years or even high pole production years, but it also can have a, a notable impact on hunting regulations. And I apologize, this one isn't updated either, but uh, gives you a sense of, of, or at least gives me some things to point at when talking about fall regulations. Um, so we, we get a lot of questions. Turkey numbers appear to have declined. Why is there still a fall season? We can talk about that if you'd like, but um, one of the notable things that we focus on whether or not a fall season is appropriate is the, the hen survival during that period, or the harvest of hens during that period. In the early 2000s, we estimated uh, hen harvest through the fall was 2 to 3%, and that included the legal harvest. So of the hens that made it into the fall, 2-3% to 3 were harvested during that fall season. The threshold, the upper threshold at which it's thought, if you exceed this, you need to start restricting your fall season, is 10%. So we are well below that threshold. It's sort of been the guideline for turkey management, at least the fall turkey season. We're, we've been well below that for a while, because actually since the, that study that got 2-3%, to 3%, we issue fewer fall permits, uh, and, and a number of other things have changed during that time as well. Uh, so we, we think we're still in a safe range with fall, but this study will help us understand that better as we're monitoring these hens through the fall. Spring season, uh, a really critical biological uh, indicator for spring season is the timing of nesting, the nest chronology. Uh, essentially, we don't want to start the spring season until the median date of incubation. So meaning, if we, we lay out all the dates of incubation for all of our hens, we want to start the season pretty close to the middle of that. So about half of your hens are already incubating a nest. The other half will, will begin incubating very soon. The reasons for that, we want our gobblers to fertilize those hens before we take them out of the woods. We don't want there to be any negative impact on wild turkey reproduction because we understand how important it is to year-to-year -year abundance of wild turkey. So when I get those questions about why can't turkey season be earlier, why can't it be earlier, well that is the reason, is we want to protect that reproductive effort and, and to do that we, we try to start the season as close to that nesting date as we can. I think that's all I've got for you and I don't know what I did for time. Perfect. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. But I, I will be happy to answer any questions you've got about how we monitor wild turkeys, about the research project, um, how regulations are set. Yes, sir. How come all of your studies are done mostly in southern counties? Everybody at this table from the Ashtoo County, the top county in the state. I realize we are the biggest. And if you do a percentage wise, we aren't the highest percentage from a land mass. But I don't believe my God. 
I'm sure you don't want me to ask you. Right. Yes, I've had a number of phone calls. He's a good friend. So we go over there. Right. We'll take full credit for the change in the in the season up north compared to down south. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. ask him. He'll tell you. He took it is. Yes. Now, over there back. Again, why are all these studies ran down south as compared to? And you throw a few of them our way. Yep. We are different. Okay. I'm yep. Sure. Uh, so yeah, very good point. So I did a poor job updating my slide. This year, 2024, I see that dotted area. we've got the dotted area is a new study site, essentially. Um, we did not monitor hens there in 2023. Initially, the plan was to do that, but some of the logistical challenges of operating three study sites, and some of them several hours apart, was, was just a little too much for year one. So actually, OSU brought in a new graduate student. Our, our initial plan was for one graduate student to operate this project fully. Um, they had to bring on an additional graduate student and put them in a camper up in your corner of the state just so we can monitor birds up there. But it's a very good point. We, those of you familiar with the spring turkey regulations, we have a northeast zone. And it, it's based on that nesting data. Birds were, were determined to nest later up there, and so the season needed to be a little bit later. And that was hunter driven, essentially. Hunters telling the division, hey, we think, we think you're too early. We did a research project in 15 and 16 before I was a turkey biologist and uh, established that Northeast Zone with five counties. So we're going to mark 50 birds up there. Uh, we've already got 17 of 50 marked, caught them on Wednesday. Um, Wednesday of this week, and so there will be a, a study area kind of focused on the Grand River Mosquito area and private property to the north and south. So 2024, we'll have that data for you. I'm excited about that because the southeast studies that you mentioned, we determined those nesting dates 20 years ago, and then the northeast study we did all by itself only about eight years ago. We did not monitor hens in the same year in those two regions. The dates were different, but we weren't monitoring this at the same time. So I'm really interested to see this spring what the difference in nest chronology will be in the same year with the same conditions. So it's a very good point. And for those of you in other parts of the state, specifically western Ohio, it's a possibility. We, uh, we had uh, Fallsville wildlife area sort of on the, on the short list as well. Um, and again, the logistics of getting to all the corners of the state in a single year are a little bit too much. So I'm waiting to hear. Uh, the chief's not here to, to tell me to be quiet or anything like that. I'm waiting to hear if there will be a continuation of this study examining different regions of the state. Because you, uh, similar to your point, we've never had a study in the western half in the agricultural landscapes. 